All right, so um, yeah, so I gave the title a little bit of a, uh, or the talk a nebulous title, The Network Architecture of Human Thought, but I'm hoping that over the course of the next hour, you'll sort of understand a little bit more about how, um, wh what that means to me. Um, so to begin with, I wanted to ask the question, you know, human thought, what do I think of when I think about human thought? And I often think about Rodin's The Thinker, um, and I asked myself, you know, what does he actually think about? And while he may be trying to solve the you know, most important questions of the universe, um, he may also be focusing on something that really motivates most of us, which is something simple like love and friendship. Um, and I think probably that that's more likely what he's thinking about than solving the problems of the universe. Um, and when I'm thinking about love and friendship, I often think about Facebook, <laughs> in which we you know, engage in, in sort of um, both loving and non-loving relationships, and in friendships and, and non-friendships. Um, so I want to ask the question, is this more than just free association? Is there something sort of more to this? Um, and so let's ask the question, what do Facebook and the brain have in common with one another? Obviously, you know, one is a social engineering system, the other one is a wet gooey organ that sits inside of our head. So on the surface of it, these two objects have nothing in common with one another. Um, but then if we look a little bit more closely, I am going to argue in this talk, um, that actually turns out they are both networks and that the network representation is something that can really help us to understand the architecture of the brain and how we use the brain um, to facilitate our own thought patterns. Um, so this slide is completely useless for this crowd. Um, but the idea <laughs> is that Facebook is a, a network in the sense that a person is a node and then a connection between two people can represent friendship. And then there may be groups of individuals who share certain properties with one another. Turns out this sort of concept of clustering or modularity is going to be very important for how we understand the brain as well. Um, so when we look at the brain, how, why am I saying that this is a network? Clearly, it's a volume of tissue, right? And I'm, I'm, while I'm going to argue that a network representation is very useful for this system, um, I am not going to forget the fact that it is also a volume of tissue. And so using the network representation, we are simplifying the system significantly. Right? The open question is, can we, how far can we still get with that rather simplistic representation? So let's look inside the brain and, and understand to what degree this representation is useful. So the idea that the brain is composed of individual pieces is something that's been around for a very, very long time and actually dates back at least to the era of phrenology, but actually if you go back to Aristotle and Plato, you'll find um, illustrations of it as well. So the idea is that different parts of the brain may be coding for specific functions. In this case, there's a reason for causality, a region for causality, a region for benevolence, veneration, hope sublimity, tune, time, etc. Um, so these very sort of uh, you know, abstract notions were thought to have very specific local placements inside of the brain. Now, what's happened over the last um, couple decades, particularly with the emergence of non-invasive imaging, but even before that in lesion studies in animals, we've realized that um, while the names, we had the names wrong, still there is some localization of function that we can point to. And therefore, there is a way that we can cut the brain up into pieces that are sort of well represented by nodes inside of the network. And how we usually do that is say, we use an MRI machine or a magnetic resonance imaging machine. We have somebody perform a task inside of the scanner, in this case, let's say, moving their fingers as if they're playing a piano piece. And then we watch to see which part of the brain is actually active. In this case, it's going to be motor cortex because they're performing a motor task, right? Then what you can do is that you can have somebody go into the scanner and perform, let's say, thousands or um, more different tasks, not the same person usually, but different people perform different tasks, and then you can map out which part of the brain is coding for which type of function, right? So the underlying idea here, and this is sort of part of an era that was called the brain mapping era, um, is that there's a map from one region to one function. Well, the functions that were postulated by phrenology are not the ones that we're really focusing on right now. Um, the underlying idea was still that there may be a map between one region and one function. Recent work has demonstrated that's, that that's still very simplistic, and that several regions do many different functions. But for the purposes of this um, introduction, let's suggest that there is at least one way in which to map um, in that case. But then the big challenge is, once you've mapped out what the regions are, what the nodes are inside of this network, how do you understand the connections that exist between those nodes? Um, what you can do is actually turn to a lot of work that's mapped out specific circuits in the brain for different kinds of cognitive processes. The language circuit is probably one of the most canonical ones that we are familiar with in neuroscience. 
And these are, we're, um, these are areas of the brain and connections between areas of the brain that help the brain process language. So in this case, written words will come in through the visual cortex. They'll be processed in Wernicke's area and Broca's area, and then eventually go out through um, somatosensory cortex when we speak back to somebody who had just been speaking to us, or we tell somebody about the book we have just been reading. Right? So that means that with linguistic processing, there's not only a set of different brain regions that are important, but there are also a specific pattern of connections between those regions that enable information to be transferred in the appropriate manner, computations being performed in the right order in order for us to respond with um, a verbal response to somebody. Okay? But then the big question is, how do we map these connections for individual people, but also how do we understand circuits they may, that may not be canonically understood for the last two decades, right? Um, and to answer that question, what we've done is that we've turned to a type of non-invasive imaging technique called diffusion imaging. This is a type of image that you can get from an MRI scanner. So anyone can go into an MRI scanner and have this kind of picture taken of their brain. It maps out large bundles of, um, of neuronal axons, which are um, the sort of long projections of neurons that connect one cell body to another cell body. So you can sort of think of these as large highways um, inside of the brain that enable information to pass from one piece of the brain to another piece of the brain far away from it. Right? Um, what's fascinating about this architecture is that it's different for each one of us. Um, and in fact, many people have referred to it as a fingerprint of you. Um, so this is a pattern that sort of, you know, to some degree we've been able to see a little bit about how if it's different in certain ways that predicts that you are good at certain kinds of tasks or that you have a certain level of IQ or um, etc. The mapping is not very well known yet, but there are correlative studies that have demonstrated that individual differences in this map tell you something about, what, about that particular person. Um, so we can really refer to these as the edges inside of our network. So here's one of our um, brains, individual brain areas will be treated as nodes, and then these structural highways between different parts of the brain will be treated as the edges inside of the network. Um, then we can use tools from network science to try to understand that architecture, and importantly to understand um, how that architecture impacts on how the system can actually function. And while we're talking about function, I think it's useful to think about how the system actually works, right? So there may be packets of information that are um, placed in visual cortex because you're seeing something, you're seeing me talking and gesticulating to you, um, and then that information is being passed uh, along these white matter tracks to different parts of the brain in order for computations to be performed. And that suggests to us that there are actually at least two representations of this system as a network that are important to keep in mind. One is that structural um, highway picture, right? And the next one is the traffic that actually exists on those highways at any particular time. We'd love to understand how much information is being passed along one of those tracks at any particular time, and how does that amount of information, where the traffic is, tell us about how, what the person is actually doing or potentially thinking. Um, while that's a great idea, um, we don't actually have non-invasive ways of measuring traffic flow on uh, these big bundles of neuronal axons non-invasively in humans. There are invasive ways of doing that in animals. There are no non-invasive ways of measuring that traffic flow in a human. Okay? So what we're going to do instead is use a very indirect measurement of traffic flow. Um, and these are often referred to in the field as functional brain networks to distinguish them from the structural brain networks that I just told you about, which really are structural wires inside of the head. Okay? Um, a functional brain network here will still treat those individual brain regions that, that are active at different points in time as the nodes inside of the network, but now the edges we will use a measurement of functional similarity. Um, in this case, what I'll show you, most of the data I'm going to show you, is using a uh, magnitude squared coherence of wavelet coefficients, which gives us an idea of sort of coupling in a certain frequency band, um, coupling of neuronal activity uh, uh, in a certain frequency band. And that's going to be treated as, a, as an edge inside of this network. Because it's a coherence, we're going to have fully weighted graphs um, so we're not going to binarize this information. We're going to maintain all weights on all edges for the data that I'll show you. Uh, well, except for some visualizations, which are simpler to do in, in, with binary edges. So how do we study functional brain networks? Um, and I think this is a really, probably a common topic of conversation that you have here. 
while network science provides us with a lot of neat tools that we can use to study different kinds of complex systems, there's often the question of, should I take the entire battery of possible techniques and statistics out there and throw it at the system I'm most interested in in some rather haphazard fashion um, and hope that something comes out? Or should I have a hypothesis that there's a particular sort of network structure or, or a phenotype that I should imagine is important for this system, and therefore I'm going to go tackle that and see if I can find it and understand how it works. Um, I think the latter sort of more hypothesis-driven approach sometimes can help us get away from um, false positive errors, for example. So what we like to do in a lot of our work is to study clustering structure or modularity in these networks, and that's for a couple reasons. The notion of modularity in the brain is something that has been around, conceptually speaking, in psychology and neuroscience for actually a very long time. Um, there's a really interesting book called Modularity of Mind from the 1980s by Jerry Fodor, which suggests that there is sort of a very um, simple, segregated structure in the brain that enables it to function. Um, and while that simple segregation is, again, something we're, we're thinking a lot about and, and we think that there's actually a lot more interconnectivity than was initially thought, that notion of modularity as important for how a brain works is something that it remains to be very true. The other important reason that I think that modularity is important for the brain is that this system evolved over evolutionary timescales, um, and modularity offers systems room for local adaptation. Um, and local evolution that can enable a piece of the system to change without largely affecting other parts of the system. And that's something that seems to be true um, for neural systems specifically. So we study community structure in networks and in brain networks specifically because I think that it's very relevant for how the system evolved, but also how the system actually functions. So here's an illustration of what that looks like for a brain uh, network. On the right hand side you have the lateral surfaces of the brain, which means the outsides. Um, here you have the medial surfaces of the brain, which is the, in, the inside of the two hemispheres. Um, and then the, each of these dots, uh, there's we measure the neural activity in those dots, or a proxy of neural activity. And then over here you have um, a binary representation of the functional connections between them, meaning similarity in their neural activity, similarity in their time series of neural activity. Um, what you can see is a clear modular structure, so there are groups of brain regions that tend to be more densely connected than other groups. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, which is very important for those of you who are interested in sort of spatial mapping or embedding of networks, is that some of these clusters are very local, so the orange ones, for example, very localized, and then other clusters that are just as strong are very spatially distributed, see these ones, for example on both the lateral and medial surfaces. Can you give a ballpark? So how many nodes typically do you consider and how many edges? That's a great question. Um, what I usually like to... Yeah, the question is how many nodes and how many edges are present in the graph. For the functional graphs, uh, like I said, I all the data that I will show from my studies is fully connected, so all edges exist. Um, in this particular case, we find the, the, the authors binarized it for ease of visualization. The number of nodes, we often separate the brain into about 200 regions to over a thousand. Um, the, the actual resolution of the imaging technique, we can have about 20,000 maps um, right now. And here you represent this as undirected networks, right? And I assume that a lot of those must be directed from the brain? Um, well, it depends. This particular data was the edge statistic was a Pearson correlation, in which case it's not directed. Um, for data where you have enough, uh, a long enough time series to estimate directionality, then it will be directed, yes. So where's the diffusion imaging? I guess, the diffusion directed. imaging is actually undirected. So we watch the sort of um, most probable direction of diffusion, uh, but um, it's, you sort of, we're not actually able to measure that it's one, one direction versus the other. It's just sort of the principal axis of diffusion, I should say. So those are all undirected right now. But an interesting question is, is that the true story, or are a lot of these actually directed? We can't ask, answer that in humans, but we can answer it with animal studies. So in macaque, for example, um, the estimates are that at least 80% of these mesoscale connections are bidirectional, and up to 20% are directed. So the bidirectional estimate is good up to you know, 80% accuracy. And then the rest could be uh, directed. 
Also, I should say that that's different than the neuronal scale. So if you look at individual neurons, there will be a specific direction of the synapse. But if, when you're talking about these big bundles of neuronal axons, most of them are bidirectional. So, and, yeah. and you measure oxygen or blood or, or electricity? Um, oh, in this one, this one was a bold fMRI. So blood oxygen level dependent signal. So that's what this is, if you take the cortical tower, cortical circuits, it's yeah. directed, right? Um, some of it is. Mm -hmm. Not, but there are, you know, it's also the, a question of scale. So these imaging techniques can allow you to see um, diffusion on the order of one to two millimeters cubed. Um, but again, I, as you go smaller, of course, there is more directed information. Um, so I think uh, this, oh, I forgot to tell you the most important part of this slide, which is that um, these clusters over the last couple of years, not all, they've been very reliably identified, but what's been more interesting, I think, is that these clusters are composed of regions that tend to perform similar functions. So um, regions in the visual cortex, for example, tend to be very strongly functionally connected. Regions in the motor cortex tend to be strongly functionally connected. Um, regions in the auditory cortex tend to be strongly functionally connected. So it suggests that this network representation, while it's thrown away a lot of information about the brain, um, is able to show us a clustering structure that maps onto a clustering of cognitive processes. So it's a representation that is true to the um, cognitive dimensions that we think are really relevant uh, for a human. Is this mostly based on resting state activity? This one is, but I'll show you some task data in a second. Um, so here are a bunch of the questions that have uh, arisen from those first few studies. Um, the first one, in psychology, we want to know how these network modules change in different brain states. Um, in neuroscience, we want to understand the roles of specific um, neurophysiological processes or specific neurotransmitters um, uh, in these modules. In medicine, we want to understand how networks are altered in psychiatric or neurological disorders. In mathematics, we want to understand what types of graphs brain networks are most like and why. In statistics, we want to understand how we can parse significant structure from noise in the networks. In physics, we want to understand what role does the network structure play in material properties. And that's particularly important in understanding mild traumatic brain injury or traumatic brain injury more generally. Um, that white matter architecture that I showed you has very different physical properties than gray matter structure. Um, and so therefore has a role to play in where impact is transmitted in traumatic brain injury. In engineering, we want to understand how we can control this network or potentially design new networks. And then in art, we're trying to understand what role the network structure plays in the creative process and why. So many of these questions our lab is, is trying to address in various ways. Um, but I wanted to uh, ask the question, you know, are we, are we done now? This is a whole set of really cool questions we can be, we can be done. Um, or at least for the next five years, maybe. Um, but I think we're not done. And the reason why I think that we're not done is that there's at least one massively important factor that we're completely ignoring in that whole or, um, picture, which is dynamics, right? Um, the brain is a dynamic system. Um, coming up with a single static representation of the system can't be the real answer. Um, and we can't really build a theory about the brain unless we can include time in the theory, right? So what a lot of my lab has been doing over the last couple of years is to try to bring back time. Um, that sounds weird, but to, you know, <laughs> to include time in the, in the, in the uh, story here. So the simplest way to do that is, again, to start with the brain, um, separate out the individual nodes as we have done before, again, measure the neural activity in each of these regions. But now, instead of calculating a correlation or a coherence or some directed measure from the entire time series, I look at individual time series and say, in, or individual time windows and say, in that time window, what is the pattern of functional connections that I observe? In the next time window, what's the pattern that I observe? In the next time window, and the next time window. Um, so that enables me at least to have a little bit more of a continuous wow. estimate of how this thing is reconfiguring <coughs> as somebody is actually performing a task. Um, but I still think that this modular structure is something that's very important. So we've been focusing on the, ana on the analyses that enable us to watch the reconfiguration of these network modules as people are performing the task. Um, we focused mostly on an extension of the modularity quality function that was initially proposed by Mark Newman. Um, in this case, we use an extension from wonderful colleagues Mason Porter and Peter Mucha, 
uh, in their paper in 2010, where they basically extend a simple notion of modularity, which, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, there's a maximization of the differences between the actual adjacency matrix <coughs> and the null model, um, subject to the assignment of nodes to individual communities. So they just extend that into um, a third dimension, which enables us to tackle time in a meaningful way. It also adds in a um, coupling term, which links a node in one um, time slice to itself in the next time slice. And what's nice about that is if you tune the coupling term high, um, then you can see structure that's true over very long time scales. And if you tune the, cu the coupling term low, um, then you can see very high frequency changes in the network dynamics. And so what's useful about this approach, I think, is that it enables you to really be sensitive to both long time scale and short time scale changes in the network architecture as somebody is performing um, a cognitively demanding um, process. So, of course, once you have reconfiguring modules, there are still uh, several different phenotypes that you could observe. Um, one of them that we have found particularly useful is this notion of flexibility. And I'm illustrating that at the top here. So here I have a little toy network with three different modules. I have one node that's initially attached to the pink module. And you can see as time goes on, it has a connection with the yellow module, and then two connections with the yellow module, and then all connections with the yellow module, and none with the pink. So there's been a transfer of that region between modules, right? In this case, I'm showing it to you as a binary network because that's a simple way to show it to you. But um, all of these edges in reality in the brain are fully weighted. And so this is an assignment of a region to a module based on the strength of its connections to that module. Um, so what we do is that we say a region of the brain is very flexible. If it, has, if it changes its allegiance to different modules over time, um, more often than expected in a normal model. And we call a region rigid if it changes its association to modules over time less than expected in a dynamic network null model. Um, and once we've defined that for a particular region, we can also define it for a whole brain as just the average of the flexibility of all of your regions. Right? So then one brain could be highly flexible if all of its regions are changing frequently, or it could be very rigid if most of its brain regions are not changing. So we've used this um, idea to really understand what happens when the brain has to change or help us to change our own behavior. And so a large focus of the lab over the um, beginning years was on understanding visual motor learning. And here's an illustration of what that looks like. So apparently this is a lot like um, Guitar Hero, which I've still never played. But if anybody in the audience has played it, this is apparently very similar. Which is that you hold a, a button box in your hand that has four buttons on it. They're color coded, and then in, while you're laying inside of the scanner, you see this pseudo musical snap, <coughs> which tells you press the purple button, and then the blue button, and then the green button, and then the red button, etc. Right? So you practice this piece over and over and over on your little button box. Um, you get faster and faster and faster. And what we observe is um, two things. In very early learning, over the first three days of training, the amount of flexibility in the brain is highly correlated with how well this is actually being learned. And we quantify the learning rate by the exponential drop-off in how long it takes to play one of these pieces, one of these little sequences. Um, so it turns out if you're practicing finger movements, you, and you start off, let's say, taking about five seconds to play one of these, and then over three days at least, you usually get down to about three seconds. And that curve of fall-off is, is um, an exponential. So we fit that with an exponential curve. We take the uh, the drop-off um, parameter, and that's our learning rate here, which is positively correlated with the amount of flexibility in the brain. So each dot is a person in this particular study. And these are the regions of the brain that are very, whose flexibility is most predictive of the learning rate. Um, but then we extended this over a longer period of learning, because learning is not, it's, you know, we are learning our entire lives. Learning doesn't just happen over three days. And an open question is, are the phenotypes the same over three days as over weeks or years um, or a lifetime? We, because of the pace of science, we start with six weeks, not a lifetime. Yeah. How do you deal with error rates? That's a great question. So he asks, how do we deal with error rates? Um, so in this case, what we ask is for the participants to play this as accurately as possible. And so our error rates are actually quite low. Um, I think they're 0.5% or something. And we don't delete all of so We don't study any of that data. If you want to understand the error rates, we would have to tell them to focus on 
probably speed more than accuracy to make sure that they're going quickly and allow themselves to, to have errors. In this particular case, they have so few that we don't have enough power to assess them. There was a question in the back. Is that or no? Um, I'm going to do Ah, OK. Um, but then the other, so over the course of six weeks, what we have is um, a really large fall off in the connectivity of the frontal cortex and the anterior cingulate, which is right here, with the rest of the brain. And what's really interesting about that is those are areas of the brain that are very important for what's called cognitive control, which is a broad notion of how um, we control our own behavior, we inhibit inappropriate responses, we um, link disparate sources of information. It's associated with notions of um, executive function and decision making and um, other sorts of, of higher order cognitive function. And so it's really interesting to notice that the learning was actually um, characterized by a drop off in the connectivity of this system. And actually, individuals who, who released this system more quickly were ones who were learning better than the people who did not release the system quickly. And well, the way that we interpret that is if you're learning a new motor skill, which may be piano playing or it may be sports, um, often what you need to do is to push that behavior down into motor memory and not continually think about every little movement that you have to perform, right? This system, we think of this system as the part of the brain that's helping you to think about every little movement as you perform it. What's next? What should my strategy be, et cetera? Um, and we actually see that the release of that system, which we infer as the pushing down the behavior into motor memory, is most characteristic of swift learning. Um, and we followed up on this idea over a couple different studies um, that demonstrate that those areas in particular in frontal cortex and in the uh, anterior cingulate cortex are important not only for uh, motor learning but also for individual differences in working memory, um, other sorts of learning, and also <coughs> cognitive flexibility. So does anybody in the audience know um, what a TRAILS B score is? Yes. Okay. Um, so probably not everybody does, so I'll just explain um, what that is. So you're handed a piece of paper. <laughs> what? Only you know. Only one. <laughs> so I'm sorry, you can close your ears for a second. Um, so uh, you're handed a piece of paper that, or one instantiation is that you're handed a piece of paper that has the numbers 1 through 26 randomly dispersed across the page, and the letters A through Z randomly dispersed across the page. And you're asked to connect the letter 1, or the number one to the letter A to the number two to the letter B to the number three to the letter C, et cetera, right? So you're trying to go through all of the numbers and all the letters, but you have to change the rule each with each um, uh, link that you make. So it's a, the, how quickly you can do that is a measurement of your cognitive flexibility. Um, and that is also very highly correlated with flexibility in these areas of the brain. So particularly cognitive flexibility, as measured by the TRAILS-B score, is correlated with brain flexibility as measured by these changes in the network modules. You have to do it in order or you can do it in any order you want? Uh, you have to do it in order. One, two, three. No, no, sure, but at the end, the result should be in order, but uh, how you do it? It's the time, total time. It's the total time, yeah, to go in order, one to A to two to B to C to D. Yeah, it's a paper and pencil class, so. Yeah, yeah, but, you, but you start it's with, computer. Could you start with two to B and then sure. later on and so on? You can't, I don't think you're allowed to. Yeah. <laughs> it's called cognitive flexibility, not cognitive creativity. <laughs> All right. Um, so then, so then, what we did is that we asked the question of if, the, if these areas are so important and their flexibility is so important in this wide variety of different tasks that are that are relevant for us, are there ways for us to modulate it? Could we make it higher in a person? Could we help somebody to be more flexible than they naturally would be, for example? And if so, would that uh, correlate with changes in their learning capacity? So, so these are all very big questions. Um, so we started with asking the question of how much is the flexibility in a person's brain changing over days? And for that question, we use a really beautiful data set that's actually freely available online. A cognitive neuroscientist, whose name is Russell Poldrack, scanned himself twice a week for an entire year and then deposited all of his data for everyone in the field to use. It's really fantastic. What's even more important is that one day of every week he was fasting um, and he had blood work drawn and then the other day he was allowed to eat. Um, so for an entire year, it's a really massive um, um, commitment uh, to the field, which I think is really amazing. 
So we take this data and we calculate the flexibility of his brain on each of those days over the course of the entire year, map out how variable they are. The entire um, study is, is just published recently this year. But the basic idea of the study is that um, when Russ was feeling very positive, he had higher brain flexibility. When he was feeling negative, he had less um, high brain flexibility. Um, his level of arousal or attentiveness was actually inversely related to flexibility. So the more he had a, a surprised or aroused feeling in the sense of sort of um, fight or flight response, uh, the less brain flexibility he had. And then both of these were independently predicted to some degree by how rested and fed he was. Um, if he was rested and fed, he tended to be more positive and less um, aroused, and then he had more brain flexibility. Right, so I, I like to, sometimes I, I show this slide to classrooms, uh, classroom teachers and, and always tell them that no, it's not rocket science. You could have told me that, that when your kids sleep well, they tend to do better in the classroom. Um, but it's nice to be able to see some underlying neural mechanisms from a network perspective um, to uh, support that and quantify that to some degree. So the next question we had was, um, you know, maybe we could suggest better ways in which kids could be, you know, resting and sleeping better. Um, or resting and eating better uh, to change brain flexibility, but there are individuals that you want to be flexible who are not necessarily capable of changing their life, um, their life skills. So what happens in that situation? And to address that situation, we actually moved to medicine. And here, um, for example, is a really beautiful study that was published last year from Erz Braun. This was a collaboration between my lab and the lab of Andreas Meyer Lindenberg and Heinrich Toast in the Central Institute of Mental Health in Mannheim, Germany. And here what we have is 41 uh, individuals who underwent a pharmacological challenge with an NMDA receptor antagonist. And people who were on that antagonist um, had much higher brain flexibility than people who took placebo. So that indicates to us that there are medications that can alter whole brain flexibility for individuals for whom other lifestyle changes are not um, a possibility. So the fact that this is an NMDA receptor antagonist is really interesting. That suggests that there's an important role for glutamate and an excitatory inhibitory balance in the brain that's driving or, or responsible to some degree for the, the uh, whole brain flexibility. But given the positivity result of the last slide, I also think there's probably a role for things like serotonin and dopamine as well. And given the role of arousal on the last slide, I also think that there's a role for norepinephrine too. So an open question right now is which neurotransmitters are actually driving this more than others and in which cohorts of individuals. Um, the other interesting question that we've been tackling most recently, and this is one that's just in press right now, it should come out, and I was hoping it was going to be out for today, but it's not out for today, but it'll be out there soon, and it's also on BioArchive if you want to find it, um, is the question of is it possible to, um, or the global question of is it possible to change uh, social support in order to um, affect a more flexible brain. While we don't tackle that harder question in this paper, what we do show is that individual differences in brain connectivity can be linked to um, and are correlated with the density of your uh, ego network. So it suggests that there's a very real connection between what's happening um, in your brain and uh, the, the social structure in which you exist. How is this friendship network defined? This is from this is uh, based on ego networks from um, the kids' Facebook. So, and how well do you think that correlates with the real friendship network that they have? That's an open question. Um, from previous studies from, from my collaborator, Emily Falk, I think that she thinks that this is a fairly good um, um, indicator for at least this cohort. So these are 80 adolescent males, around 16 year old. But I'm sure we could also go through and ask them specifically, you know, who their friends are, et cetera, and, and get even better data. Um, so then the open question uh, now is, is flexibility always good? Um, and I think the answer is no, and, and that's for a couple reasons. So here on the, on the x-axis I have flexibility, on the y-axis I have sort of some notion of optimal cognitive function, but for cognitive neuroscientists in the room, what I, what I think that this is correlated with is executive function specifically. So we know it's related to working memory, we know it's related to cognitive flexibility, and we know it's related to learning capacity on, two, on reinforcement learning tasks and on um, visual motor learning tasks. So 
um, we have some initial data that suggests that children um, are increasing in their um, flexibility. They also increase in their cognitive function as they grow. In adults, we see a positive correlation. So individuals who have higher flexibility um, tend to have better um, cognitive functions on those three tasks. But then we also have a paper that um, just came out which demonstrates that schizophrenia, in people who have schizophrenia, they have much higher flexibility than in the healthy individuals. Um, and this was uh, uh, by Braun as well. And what you see here is not only that healthy controls have less flexibility than people with schizophrenia, but also that relatives of individuals with schizophrenia have an intermediate value. And that suggests that this notion of network flexibility is an intermediate phenotype for the disease, potentially related to alterations in glutamate and excitatory inhibitory balance in the disease, which is something that has been mentioned previously by several other studies. Um, so this is something that offers a, uh, a network a phenotype or a network um, um, process that may be indicative of that alteration at, the, at those very, very small scale. So I would suggest that flexibility is potentially not always good. Um, so what we're doing right now is to try to figure out exactly what kinds of flexibility are best. Um, so taking this x-axis and parsing it into categories of dynamics that are more or less beneficial to different types of cognitive um, so then the next question is, how do transient dynamics happen? So if we think that this is critical to understand the time dynamics, we also have shown that these uh, network dynamics are related to individual differences in cognitive function and abilities. But I started the talk by showing you that there is this hardwired structure in the brain, right? Um, so ideally, what you'd really like to have is some underlying theory that links these two together admits that there's a hardwired structure, but then also um, explains or predicts the functional dynamics that occur on top of it. So um, we've been trying to tackle this by looking at um, the ideas of control theory and structural controllability. And I know that that's something that a lot of people in the room have uh, done some really beautiful work on over the last couple of years. Um, so here, the general idea, for those people who are not uh, familiar with that particular set of work from this institute and others, is the idea that if you have a network system, there may be a particular point in the system that's very useful to inject energy in order to um, push the system in a very particular type of dynamics or towards a particular type of state. And that injecting energy into, let's say, this orange node, it could have a very different impact on network dynamics than injecting energy into one of the gray nodes. And the underlying idea is to basically ask where in the system should I inject energy if I want to uh, have a very specific change in the dynamics of the system. So in the brain, uh, you can see actually in one of the earlier papers, we show that um, the system is, is in general very difficult to control. So we focused our efforts on really identifying very specific control strategies that may be accessible to the brain and also may be important for different types of cognitive function. So the idea here is that you have a brain at a particular state. You want to be able to push it into a new state with some different pattern of activity. Um, and you want to ask how to, where and when to inject control energy. We use this very simple um, linear model of dynamics, similar to a lot of the work that has been done um, here as well. We have not yet extended it into a nonlinear model of dynamics, um, but that's something that we're very interested in doing. But using this linear model, what this is saying is, first of all, that the state of the brain at time t plus 1 is equal to the adjacency matrix, which is that, just that um, pattern of structural connections that I showed you earlier times the state of the brain at time p, and then plus some control. So mu is the control energy that's injected into cavernodes in the system. Um, one um, important thing to do right now is to ask, what do I mean by a brain state, right? What I mean by a brain state is a pattern of activity over the entire brain. So it's a vector that's 1 by n, where n is the number of nodes in the network, and it measures or it estimates, or guesses, the um, the magnitude of activity at each of those points. Okay. I measured by the blood, blood the accident. Right now I'm going to show you a computational study, so then it's a, it's un, uh, yes, but the idea is that it models um, a bold signal. Yeah, and we've also been actually testing it on some ECOG data as well. Yeah. Um, so here are the three different control strategies we've studied. Average controllability, meaning the ability to steer to many easily reachable states. Modal controllability is the ability to steer to a few difficult to reach states. 
and then boundary controllability is the ability to steer the system in, into states where different sub, uh, different communities inside of the network are either coupled or decoupled. From <coughs> the network. And to put a little bit of a point on that, um, where again, this is the linear model we're using. Here's the controllability Gramian for that linear model. The average controllability is given by the trace of the inverse of the Gramian, and intuitively allows you to ask questions about relatively easily reachable nodes inside or of the of the energy landscape. Modal controllability, so this is based basically on the on the eigenvector and eigenvalue structure of the adjacency matrix. So here we let V sub J be the Jth eigenvector of A, where again A is the diffusion imaging um, adjacency matrix with a particular eigenvalue lambda J. Then if the element Vij is small, then the Jth node is poorly controllable from that particular node I. And then um, we actually base this on work from uh, Fabio Pasqualetti, who defines this scaled structure or, or measure here uh, that allows us to ask questions about the controllability of all n modes from a particular uh, region i. So what does that look like on the brain? Um, so here are those different types of controllability, average, modal, and boundary on the x-axis. Here's the amount of controllability. And then the three boxes that I'm showing you here are three different parts of the brain that uh, people have suggested previously, cognitive neuroscientists in the study, um, for their potential role in cognitive control. Um, so on the left is the default mode system, where you can see it has very strong average controllers here. In the middle is the frontal parietal system, and that's the green part, um, which has very strong modal controllers. And then in the right is um, the attentional control circuit, which has strong boundary controllers. So what does that mean? Um, first of all, the fact that the default mode system has this very high average controllability, that's really interesting because um, theoretically, those are the areas that should be good at pushing you into local, easily reachable states on the energy landscape. Um, and those tend to occur very strongly in this uh, default mode system, which is the set of brain areas that are very active when you're sitting, resting, not doing anything in particular. Why I think that's interesting is that if you were to build a brain and you wanted to make an optimal brain, you might want to put it at its baseline in a state where the regions that are active are the ones that are able to push you into most of the places that you might need to go. So intuitively, this you could argue that this would be an optimal way of building a system, a base, baseline dynamic system. The reason this sort of middle section is really interesting is that these regions in green are regions are known to be very active when you switch between different tasks, and particularly very different tasks. So for example, um, I'm working on a math problem, and then my grandmother calls me up. That's a really hard <coughs> transition for me. And the regions of the brain that are very active when that happens are in the sort of frontal parietal system. At least somebody laughed. <laughs> um, in uh, red is the attentional circuitry, and these are very high in boundary controllability. What's interesting about that is that attention is really thought to be a gating mechanism or affiliated with a gating mechanism that you could imagine um, is related to control of different communities inside of the brain. Um, oh good, that's all what I just told you, so I can skip that slide. Um, so what does that suggest? Well, it suggests that network control might be a mechanism for cognitive control, because basically these systems that have been thought uh, by cognitive neuroscientists be to be important for cognitive control for a long period of time actually have very interesting structural uh, markers that enable them to perform the control action that they're known to perform. So I think what this does is it gives us an explanation for why those regions do what they do. Um, why is the frontal parietal, why are they, why are the frontal parietal regions located where they are? Well, because they have an underlying white matter architecture that enables them to perform that specific function that they're known for, right? So what this suggests to us is that while most of uh, the work that's been done in the literature is really focusing on the computations that occur in specific brain regions and brain matter regions that enable cognitive control, we think that there's another part of the story, which is the structural pattern of connections between brain regions that enable them to perform the function that they need to perform. All right, so it's a suggestion. Now we have to see if we can follow that up with additional evidence to support the suggestion. Um, so one of the ways that we've been doing that is to ask the question, does network control emerge in youth? The reason that we ask that is because um, cognitive control is something that is not very well, does not well characterized young children. 
So um, my five-year-old, my two-year-old still can't figure out the fact that you know when they make each other mad, they shouldn't hit each other. Um, that's something that you learn as you get older. And in fact, more globally, cognitive control and executive function is something that doesn't even really hit adult levels until um, after even you know 22, 25-ish. Um, depending on the accounts that you read. So it's really quite a long time. It's one of the later functions to develop in the brain, while motor cortex, motor function, and visual function are very well uh, developed by the time the kids got into the um, So what we did is that we said, well, if cognitive control is really changing drastically over this period of time, then we would hypothesize that network control should be changing too, inside of the brain. So we asked that question in collaboration with Raquel Berg, who is a PI on a large NIH study. They collected um, data from 10,000 children in the Philadelphia area. It's a community-based sample. Um, of those 10,000 children, 2,000 had their imaging done, which means um, scans of their brain. And then of those 2,000, after quality assurance checks, we had 882. Probably you want to know why we dropped from 2,000 to 882. And the largest region is actually motion artifact inside of the scanner. It's really difficult to keep kids still in a scanner, and motion artifact is really hard to get rid of in, in brain imaging data. Um, and so we're being fairly conservative here, but I think that's important for us to do so that our findings of development are not conflated with changes in motion. Because little kids move more than big kids. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so this is the data so far. So here on the x-axis is mean average controllability per subject, so every dot is person. On the y-axis is mean motor controllability per person. There's a positive relationship here. Um, and importantly, uh, this cloud of data points is significantly offset from two different null models. In yellow, we have a null model that preserves no strength, and then in pink, we have a null model that preserves no degree. Um, so, both, so these two axes suggest that the two kinds of controllability track with one another over time, not exactly linearly, but um, that close. Um, and then we also show that those both increase with development. So over the ages of 8 to 22, well, you can observe that there's a lot of individual differences here. There's a positive trend, meaning that both average and normal controllability increase as kids um, grow older. And importantly, we also show that after we uh, regress out the effect of age, we, then we just look at individual differences in cognition that can't be explained by where you are on the developmental curve. <coughs> we see that controllability statistics are correlated with individual differences in um, cognitive abilities. So that, su so that suggests to us that this um, basic notion of network controllability is not just something that helps us to understand how the adult brain might function, but is also corroborated by um, changes in the developmental trajectory. So as kids um, full, get, you know, have higher uh, capacity for cognitive control, they also have increasing um, control statistics in their, or, or uh, profiles in their brain. So where are we going with this now? Here is the space of brain network control that I think is really interesting. Um, so I talked to you a little bit about structural control and trying to use it to understand cognitive controls, which is a very internal process. You could also use it to try to understand homeostatic mechanisms in the brain. So how does the, how does the brain actually just sort of keep its own dynamics within some specified place so that it doesn't veer off into um, seizure dynamics or, or something like that. And that's actually the work that we've been doing um, very recently with the new postdoc on Pecan Body. But we can also ask the question of not just can we use this to understand internal control, but can we use it to understand external control? So can we use it to understand where um, and how long and how we should be targeting external stimulation devices, whether they be non-invasive devices like transcranial magnetic stimulation or invasive devices like implantable um, neuropace, for example, for the control of epileptic seizures. Um, so that's a, a pretty open uh, set of areas for us. Um, we have two reviews if you're curious about this general space. One that's written for the physicists and then one that's written for um, the more neuroscientists. And both if you're both. <laughs> okay. Um, so where have we gotten to so far? I started off with talking about um, dynamic networks and how we really need to be including time in our characterization of this system because it is a dynamic system using that to try to understand learning, decision-making, cognitive control, and executive function. <coughs> then we uh, ask the question of can we understand all of this by informing it with the underlying structural connectivity that we observe in a human. Um, 
but I, I, you know, let's see, I have like maybe five minutes. I want to just say that um, all of this, all of this machinery is here for us to do something. Um, and that is, it, you know, one of the things that we do best and that's most characteristic of humans is learning. That's something that I'm really excited and interested in. So the question is, why is all of this here and how can it help us to understand um, how we're learning? I think it depends a lot on what we're trying to learn. So I titled the talk The Network Architecture of Human Thought, and I sort of made a few diversions, mostly through the organ of thought, right, which is the human brain. But I'd like to ask the question a little bit more about thought patterns, and particularly how we learn um, those thought patterns. So what are we meant to learn? Well, we're meant to learn knowledge, we're meant to learn language, particularly when we're young, where uh, we learn things often from written texts. And importantly, all of those things are networks, right? So knowledge is a network in the sense that you know that seasons, which is a note here, is determined by the amount of sunlight, which results in seasonal temperature variations, right? So our knowledge is, by definition, a network. Um, language is also a network. You can separate individual words into phonemes, and you can understand the transition probabilities between phonemes that are characteristic of a particular language. That's used a lot in artificial language development as well. And then written text is clearly a network as well. Um, so here, for example, school is very commonly uh, found next to bus, which is very commonly found next to yellow, which is commonly found next to banana, and then apple, and then plum. But plum is rarely connected to school, right? So all of these things that we learn are, are, are networks themselves. So how, how do we learn those networks? Um, and I was faced, to this per faced with this personally when I stood up in front of a class for the first time as an assistant professor at Penn and told them to say something. Um, nobody really you know, tells you how to, how to do that well. So I, I thought, you know, well, I have 15 different ideas I want to translate to this class. They have some architecture behind them, some architecture of relationships behind them. Um, so here's my 15 different ideas. There's actually a little cluster of ideas here, there's a cluster of ideas here, there's a cluster of ideas up here, and all three of them are, are also related to each other. So my challenge as I stand up in front of the classroom for my first time to translate these 15 ideas is, how do I take this complicated object and transmit it in a line because we have to obey uh, the direction of time, right? So I have to go in time, I only can say one word after the other, although you can probably tell I try to say it faster than that. Um, <laughs> it doesn't always work. So we have to follow time. Um, so how do I take this architecture, map it into 1D so that it's maximally learnable? I want them to infer this organization, but they have to infer it from a linear transmission of information. Um, so how do I do that? So to address that question, what we did is that we built on some really beautiful work from um, Anna Shapiro and Matt Botman before he moved to Google, where they looked at a pattern of objects, or in this case they're fractals, and they asked the question of, um, how we learn this pattern of fractal, fractals. They had a, a slightly different reason for studying this particular um, setup, but I'll show you why it's really relevant for us. So why it's relevant for us is that what we, what we can do is we can have those fractals, we can map a fractal to each of the nodes. So now I'm going to show a series of fractals where that series is defined by, let's say, a random walk on this graph, right? Or I could show that series of fractals by a different kind of walk, let's say a Hamiltonian walk, which hits each node at least once before hitting that node again, or an Eulerian walk, which hits each edge at least once before hitting that same edge again, right? So in this first study, we asked the question of, the network structure is defined, but we never show it to the person. All they see is a stream of visual images, and we ask if the actual walk through the graph affects how well they learn the graph, okay? How do we quantify whether they learn the graph or not? Well, how we quantify whether they learned it is that at each step we ask them if the image is rotated or straight, right? Um, and what we found is that when people are moving from one cluster to another, they're much slower at determining that that one is rotated. And we're calling it a surprisal effect because basically we think that that's an indication that there's, they realize they're moving into another cluster. It's surprising and they slow down in their reaction time um, to the rotation. So here's the data for the three different kinds of walks. The Eulerian walk has a very robust um, 20 millisecond uh, increase in reaction time. Hamiltonian walk, there's actually no significant difference from zero. And then a random walk, there's also a, a, a um, significant surprisal. So this suggests that using either a random walk or an Eulerian walk uh, is much better for learnability of the data than a Hamiltonian walk. Um, but then we've been 
extending that in a couple of different directions. Most of this is in prep, so I'm, uh, I'm happy to talk about it, but I didn't have a lot of slides to show you for it. Um, we're asking the question, which graphs are most learnable? Because when I get up and, and, and give a lecture, I have an option of which graph to show people. Well, honestly, all of the concepts are related to all of the other concepts, and it's actually a fully connected graph. I have an option of which edges to show that makes it most learnable to the, to the individual. Yes? But most knowledge is actually at least partially ordered, and that you need to know something before you want to. Learning the patterns like this, yes, you, you can have completely connected network, but uh, most knowledge is not. And so you would actually pick naturally the path to your partial order or, or something like more complex than partial yeah. order. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's absolutely true. I think it depends on what you're trying to teach, is what you're saying. And that in many cases, you need to understand one thing before you understand the next. And that gets to the question of, let's say, I could probably come up with 15 things that I want to teach people about that don't necessarily have a, are they need to know one before the other. But once I build on that throughout the course, absolutely. Yes, I completely agree. Um, the other question that we're working on is, how do we learn social networks? And do we learn them differently than we learn real networks? So each of, in that previous slide, those could have all been faces, right? These could all be faces. We're trying to understand um, how temporal uh, contingencies between faces tell us something about the social network behind that group, right? Um, and we're seeing really interesting um, effects there. And then the other thing is, is how do we even, you know, how do we build, um, I've been talking about actually teaching someone something, but for many of us, we just learn new knowledge because we're curious and we go find it, right? Um, nobody at this point is really teaching many of us. So the question is, how do we build these knowledge graphs ourselves? What are the kinds of things we're looking for? What are the kinds of links that we like to make? Um, and can we build uh, growth models that help to characterize individual differences in, in curious knowledge discovery? Uh, OK, now I'm going to really be done. Um, so here's the structure. Here's the dynamics. We want to understand how we learn network patterns in the world and put this all together. Uh, and with that, I think I'd like to acknowledge um, the people who are important in the work and the funding that supported the work. Um, in particular, this group of people shared with us the, the data from the neurodevelopmental cohort that helped us to ask the question about the emergence of network control in youth. Um, Savio Pasqualetti is a control theorist at UC Riverside, who we collaborate with. Um, Evelyn Tang, Rick Betzel, she do a and body art postdoc in the lab. Lucy Chai is an undergraduate student who actually just got a, a Churchill scholarship to go to Cambridge, so she'll be at Cambridge in the fall. Um, really sad to see her go. But with that, thank you for listening. So we have time for a few questions. So please. Yeah. Thank you so much. There's so many interesting questions I want to ask, but I'm going to leave it to one. Uh, uh, is there any particular data set that available to show the between flexibility and or network control that you measure with the some performance? For example, the students, kids' data you analyze, do they actually provide some academic performance data or some cognitive capability data? Yes. Yeah. Do you see? Yeah. We see, and we see relation, we're writing that paper right now. So we do see relationships. So flexibility is related to control, and both of them are related to individual differences in college. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, excellent talk. So my question is about the flexible regions that you talked about. So um, the way you presented it was that I'm a yellow region, and I think, um, for example, the pink region, think they were on, but which seems like very much hard or hard clustering. But I can imagine that I just have a distribution over these different colors or colors, right? And the distribution has changed. So have people looked at tracking your distributions over time as opposed to this kind of hard clustering? That's a great question. Um, I would say that what we usually do is that we do the hard clustering, but we do it uh, a large number of times, and then we look at sort of the distribution of flexibility scores for a particular region. But it still you know, started with a hard clustering. Um, so I think that we are sensitive to some amount of variation, but probably it would be even better to stop with a, start with a soft clustering first. And I haven't seen um, anyone explicitly do that. The other factor that I didn't mention but I think is really important is that um, noisy data can be flexible. So you can just have noisy regions popping back and forth. And so one of the things that we've looked at most recently is sort of a joint 
um, probability. So how likely is it when one region moves that another close by region also moves? Um, and when that happens, it seems like we get even better predictors of learning. Uh, so maybe that's a way of sort of cleaning the data. Um, two quick questions about the, the fractal uh, network yeah. uh, learning at the end. Um, what, was that done with EEG, or was that? Um, right now it's a behavioral study. We just started in the scanner two weeks ago. Okay, and then the other one is that if, can you use this um, type of experimentation to kind of extrapolate out where, if that were a subset of a, a subgraph of like a larger network of uh, fractal images that were connected, is there like a best subgraph with which the participants could learn new nodes or new mm -hmm. fractal images? I don't know, we've looked at size, so I didn't put any of that data in here. We've looked at what size of graph is most easily learnable, or um, if you keep the size the same, what uh, size of clusters is better. So right now I have three clusters of five, you could have five clusters of three, uh -huh. or you could have two clusters of three. You, could, you can separate it out in many different ways. We moved up to 24 nodes to have more options for how to separate it out. Um, so we have some data on that. Um, and there does seem to be a particular size that's, that's more learnable than others. But that's for a one-shot learning. There's also the question that we raised earlier about what happens when we want to build on that one. Um, and that's pretty important. Any other questions? So let's continue this speaker.